Hello my beautiful people, my name is Dr. Kato. Welcome to another episode of Basic Nigerian History. This is the final episode of Basic Nigerian History. Not because we've reached the end of Nigeria's history, but because we have more or less reached the point where I, Dr. Kato, happen to be living. So buckle up one final time for Basic Nigerian History. Hit the music. Last episode, we discussed how Obasanjo tried to improve Nigeria's international image by focusing on bringing in foreign investments and paying off external debts. But that meant he also ignored all of the internal issues the country had, such as poor infrastructure, education, health, and most importantly of all, corruption. This episode, we're going to take a look at how his administration actually just continued corruption instead of putting an end to it like he promised. On the 29th of May 2007, Umaru Yadua, Musa Yadua's brother, and Good Luck Jonathan of PDP became elected president and vice president respectively. The election itself had little violence, but it was marred by electoral fraud and denounced by other candidates and international observers. Reaction of Nigerians to the election was one of frustration and resignation. The people were frustrated at the corrupt practices but had become resigned to the knowledge that all politicians are corrupt, power-hungry, greedy weasels, more concerned with their self-interest than with public services. Many Nigerians seem to have given up most honestly don't think any of the opposition parties would have behaved differently if they were the ones in power. The fact that Atiku Abubakar could defect from PDP and immediately become the presidential candidate of AC shows politics isn't based on ideologies or policies, but on proximity to power and access to money. The Nigerian Bar Association tried to organize rallies to protest the election, and so did some of the opposition candidates, but most Nigerians didn't really feel involved with any of the messages of the politicians and they have heard politicians make too many grandiose claims only to disappoint later. The most recent being Obasanjo that promised to eradicate corruption only to then use corruption towards the end of his term to ensure his preferred candidate gets the position. Yadua continued ruling like Obasanjo as he was his hand-picked successor. Obasanjo remained the chairman of PDP's board of trustees. PDP's ability to manipulate and control elections seemed to be leading Nigeria towards a one-party state in which the avenue to power is no longer through contesting elections but through appeasing officials. If that becomes a reality, the party will have little accountability and won't need to rule in the best interest of the citizens of Nigeria. Not that any of the parties do anyways, but basically the Ventia state's mentality will continue. However, believe it or not, that point was the first time power had transitioned from one civilian rule to another without any military coups or issues. So I guess that's a little something to be happy about at least. The longer a stable civilian regime can stay in power, the better the chances are of developing more solid democratic institutions in the future. Furthermore, the transfer of power from a Christian president to a Muslim one, so Obasanjo to Yadua, showed that there was less ethnic and religious tensions. Also, good luck being the vice president and being a southerner from the Delta states shows diversity amongst ruling governments. Another positive point that we could take from Obasanjo's term is that some of the political powers had been used correctly and demonstrated that the system could work. For example, the power of the legislature was used to check the executive power of the president by denying the president the option to run for a third term. The judiciary had also checked both executive and legislative by overturning the allegations of corruption that Obasanjo administration was flinging at its opponents. This is a good thing because it shows separation of power can work in Nigeria and it bodes well for establishment of a more democratic governance in the long term. Umaru Yadua suffered from various illness including heart and kidney problems. And as we all know, these same politicians are the ones that made sure Nigeria's health facilities were not up to standard. So eventually in November 2009, he was flown out of the country to Saudi for treatment for his illness. And by February 2010, Good luck Jonathan began serving as acting president. In May of 2010, Yadua died of his illness and Good Luck was left in charge without any idea of what Yadua's plans had been. 
even though the increase in resource spending and oil exploitation meant some of Nigerians' ratings like the GDP and the Human Development Index HDI had increased a lot since Abacha's days, the primary population still lived on less than $2 a day, so the people's lives didn't really get any better economically. Good luck had no ethnic or religious ties to the north like Yadua. He was a target for militaristic overthrow or regional uprising. He feared the worst and was glad when it was time for re-election. The re-election took place in 2011 and good luck won it. And now that we are more or less reaching the present day era, I think there is not much need to go into detail. Those of you watching this will by no means already know how Jonathan's presidency went. It is more or less the same sad story over and over again. During Jonathan's time as president, the country experienced overall economic growth, but it didn't reach the average Nigerian. Many still lived in poverty and the country still faced more or less the same issues as during Obasanjo's time. Basically, it was mainly dominated by issues of corruption and Boko Haram terrorizing people up north and as we all know, in 2015, Buhari beat good luck in the elections and became president after a peaceful transition of power. It's kind of funny talking about something that happened in 2010 as history, but this is the thing about history. It is literally being made every day by you and me and people around us. We do not have to look back on the past and the people there as separate to us or as special in some way. We could be those people. Hence why we can learn from those people and what happened. So if you want to change the course of history, you can. You have the power to do so through the decisions you make today. And as long as there are people making decisions daily, there will always be history for historians like I, Dr. Cattell, to record. I think it's safe to say that we have reached the end of this series. Oof, what a journey it's been. I hope you have all learned a little something about the history of Nigeria from this series and that it has sparked some of you to do some further reading and research. The aim has always been to spark an interest of the country's history in the people and hopefully share some information that may not have been well known. I want to thank all of you, our followers, for watching and supporting us. Keep spreading the love and sharing it with others. Dr. Cattell, out.